It's a great question. Health equity, as I mentioned, is one of the, the two guiding themes of my term as Surgeon General. And I know it's, it's of great importance to NATO as well. And I think of health, there are many definitions of health equity, but I think of it in, in very simple terms, which is ensuring that the promise of good health, both treatment and prevention, is available to every man, woman, and child in America. And what that means to me is that where you happen to live shouldn't impact how easily you can access care that the fundamental uh, underpinnings of prevention, good nutrition, physical activity, and emotional well-being, that these shouldn't be things that are privy only to a few. Uh, and what that means is that we have to focus, as you know so well, not just on, on hospitals and clinics, but on ensuring that the environments uh, in our neighborhoods and communities uh, are supportive and conducive to good health, and making sure that those exist all across America. In terms of addressing the upstream, upstream factors, I know that this has been a big focus here, and I'm so glad to hear it, because as I've, there, were, there have been several themes that have come up as I've traveled around the country, and one of them has been uh, around the importance of, of creating uh, up, you know, more of a focus on upstream determinants of health. And one of the ways in which communities are seeking to do it uh, that have been successful is to build uh, collaborations with unexpected and non-traditional partners. I mentioned the, uh, the Richmond Family Fatherhood Initiative, which has collaborated with faith leaders and with the juvenile justice system uh, around creating stronger fathers. But we know that employers have a, a strong stake uh, when it comes to, uh, to, to impacting public health. We know that their employee productivity is impacted by the explosion of chronic disease that we've seen. We know that faith leaders care deeply about this. We know that schools as well uh, care deeply as well. The example that I mentioned about San Francisco and some of the extraordinary results that middle schools there have seen uh, with implementing this uh, very simple twice a day uh, quiet time practice, uh, which is essentially a meditation practice, uh, these are having impacts on health uh, in ways that you know, people uh, didn't quite realize. Now, the, the real question when I'm on the road and I hear from folks is, who's going to be the glue that holds these collaborations together? Who's going to be the catalyst that helps a school realize that it has a role to play in health, that helps a, an employer realize not only that it has a role, but realize how they can get started on improving health. And I actually think that all of you are that glue. Uh, I think many of you are already that glue, and I think many of you have the potential to be that glue. But I think that's what the real need is right now. Because when I, when I talk to folks around the country, I don't sense that there's a lack of interest in improving health. I sense that there's a lack of knowledge about how to go about doing it about the kind of role that these different uh, sectors can play. And that's where I, I really like the video that was shown uh, earlier today, uh, the one that I think you voiced over, which was, uh, you have a great voice for these things. Maybe we'll ask you to do something at the Office of the Surgeon General. <laughs> but one of the things I really liked about it was this idea that the role that local uh, you know, and county health leaders play is going to be different from county to county, from location to location, depending on what the collaborations look like there. And you might find yourself working really hard on enrollment in one area. You may find yourself you know, working to build these collaborations with employers in another area. But I think to the extent that you can help the country to educate various sectors about the role they can play in health and to be that glue that brings them together is I think the extent to which uh, you will help us build a prevention-based society. Thank you, that's, 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 that's great. You know, when you talk about um, stretching, Dr. Oscar Allen, um, Director of Epidemiology for Rockland County Department of Health in New York. Uh, Dr. Murthy, my question, uh, which is very warming to hear the support for local health. The reason I say that is my county has for a number of years been the second lowest 
uh, county in the entire country that had smoking in the home less than 10%. And that was a result of the work that local health uh, did with respect to communities, schools, et cetera. My question comes to the perspective of we at local health departments are sometimes don't do a good job at um, showing what we do, and we're sometimes forgotten. Uh, and in some respects, in many of the uh, processes, the funding, et cetera, that have, you've highlighted bypass local health, um, and we sometimes are forgotten. So with the language that you just used today, uh, what is within your realm to assist further into strength, uh, the infrastructure, and the community commitment, the safety net that local health departments feel being pressured out of as far as direct care or any uh, type of uh, work that they do around population or preventive health? Well, thank you for that question. I, I think it's, it is true that sometimes, and very often, local leaders who, are, who really have their shoulder to the wheel and who have their, their finger on the pulse of what's happening on the ground, sometimes don't get recognized. In fact, often don't, because they're too busy working and, and uh, not spending enough time actually getting kudos, as, as sometimes other folks are. I don't want that to change in the sense that I don't think that we should be you know, trying to divert more of your time toward uh, self-promotion. But that's actually a place where I think our office can, can help and where I want to help, which is that as, as we travel around and as we hear about what you're doing, and even if we're not coming to your area, if you can share with us through NATO and even directly uh, what you're doing, we want to lift that up and shine a light on it so that policymakers, so that the public, and so that other decision makers around the country uh, and in Washington, D.C. can understand the impact and the role that local uh, leaders are playing in advancing health. And smoking is a, is, is a good example because at a time when budgets are being uh, really constrained, when everyone is really tightening their belt, uh, sometimes programs which aren't as, uh, don't seem as snazzy or as sexy you know, as, uh, as others, sometimes they get cut even though they have great public health benefit. And I believe that the efforts that we put into reducing smoking are some of the greatest investments that we can make in public health. We know that in terms of lives lost, in terms of dollars spent, uh, that investing in smoking, whether it's having clinicians talk to, to folks about smoking, whether it's having uh, you know, hard-hitting ads against smoking, uh, as the FDA and CDC and others have done in local health departments, uh, whether it's investing actually in, uh, in a discussion of how to better regulate uh, uh, cigarettes. These are all areas where we save much more in terms of dollars uh, than we do in terms of what we spend. So I want to make sure that we're not losing a uh, side of that. And so to the extent that our office can help focus efforts on highlighting examples uh, of what you're doing on the ground that's working, we want to do that. But there's a second thing that we can do, uh, which we want to do a lot more of, which is to come and speak with uh, local elected leaders, people who are making decisions about budgets, uh, about what the public health priorities and needs are uh, of the country. You know, I, I think that my belief, having worked with and met with many legislators, is that I think you know, nearly everyone I've met with really is there for the right reason. They want to do, do well by their community, but they're also hearing lots of different ideas from lots of different people. Uh, and they can't be an expert on every single topic that's out there. And that's why, to whatever extent, you know, myself and our office can help in this process, we want to make it clear uh, to, to local health uh, you know, officials that when, and to elected leaders that when you're trying to make difficult budget decisions, there are a few places uh, which are really best buys. Uh, and it turns out tobacco and smoking uh, you know, is, is one of those areas. So we want to help make that case. We'd be happy to, uh, to work with you and to work with others on that. Uh, I'm happy to say that you know, today we, uh, we recently hired a, a director of external engagement who's uh, Siobhan Arline Bradley is over there waving uh, on the right. Uh, but Siobhan is going to be a wonderful uh, connection for us to, uh, to NATO and to other groups around the country. And we want to make sure we're, uh, we're helping you in whatever ways we can uh, to make sure people know what you need uh, and they know where to be investing in terms of public health needs. Great. Thank you for your question. Let's Hello. I'm Amy Popovich with Richmond City Health District, Richmond City health District which you mentioned our Family Fatherhood Initiative. Um, I work with community health workers. Um, these are women and men who live in public housing and are health educators, are peer navigators to medical homes, and they have a wonderful understanding of what that means to live in public housing and to connect people to health. Um, how are we ensuring that people who are most affected by our nation's health disparities have a seat at the table and their voices heard at the national level? 
That's a great question. Uh, I, uh, a couple of things I would say. One is that, one just first, thank you for the great work you're doing on community health worker models uh, and for all the great work that is happening in Richmond. Uh, when I visited there, I was very excited at our listening session to learn not just about the Fatherhood Initiative, but about <laughs> so many great things that are happening at the Department of Public Health and in the community. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, you, you know, I, secondly, I, I wanna say that there is a great deal of attention that's being paid uh, to disparities in health where I sit in Washington, D.C., not just in our office of the Surgeon General, but in the Office of Minority Health, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, at, at various departments across the Department of Health and Human Services, and really throughout the administration. Um, and that has been encouraging for me to see, uh, is that a lot of the, the talk around uh, you know, health disparities and resolving them is not just talk, but it's being backed up uh, by programs, by, by action, uh, by initiatives, and by funding. Uh, from the federal government, so that is really good to see. The question of how to make sure, though, that at a state and local level, uh, that communities which are traditionally disadvantaged uh, are actually having a voice at the table, that's a really important one. And, and I, think that that, I think that comes from local uh, leaders like yourself and, and other community organizations uh, really engaging and, and pushing members of those communities forward uh, to speak up. Now, it's not always easy if you're in a disadvantaged uh, position to speak up. You know, it's if you don't have resources, if you're ill, um, if you don't know how to engage with a, a local representative, it can be very hard. And, and I will say that in my prior job, prior to being Surgeon General, this is one of the issues that, uh, that I thought about, was how do you mobilize different populations who have a lot of ideas and a lot of needs uh, and a lot to share about healthcare? How do you actually engage them in speaking with decision makers so they can share their perspective and make sure that their, their needs are being met? Uh, so I think that this is, a, this is a, a certainly a, a challenging issue, but I think that the best way uh, that I know of to do it is to make sure that, that we are, when we're taking folks uh, to meet with legislators, when we're taking people to meet with local decision makers, that we're ensuring that those groups are, are well represented. And it's actually up to those of us who have power, uh, who have some degree of privilege, to ensure that the groups that we're taking are equally well represented. Uh, like I said before, I don't think that legislators or decision makers at any level purposely try to exclude folks uh, from getting care. Uh, but I think a lot of the disparities that we see, they happen, uh, they happen because we, so folks sometimes don't realize that they're actually there. They don't realize that there are disparities that are getting worse and worse and worse, sometimes uh, as a byproduct of well-intentioned decisions uh, that we're making, particularly around funding. But I think that the way to shift that is to make sure that groups uh, like yourself and like others that are on the ground are actually bringing those voices to the table and connecting uh, decision makers with them. And I think that can make a big difference. One last point that I'll make, just coming back to your community health worker, uh, uh, the models and the, and the work that you're doing, which is that I think that there is, we are kind of in a really interesting and extraordinary moment where I think uh, when it comes to community health worker models, because I think what these models represent is an effort to take care out of hospitals and clinics and actually bring them much more proximate uh, to patients, really to their homes and to their neighborhoods. And I think that this is actually the future you know, of medicine. I think that if we use technology, right, and if we actually are flexible and open in thinking about how we build care models, that in the future we will see, I think, less and less uh, of a need for uh, the large number of hospital beds that we have now. Uh, and even though we worry sometimes when, right now, when hospitals close down and such, and I think we worry with good reason because sometimes this happens in neighborhoods that you need those hospitals, I think that in the future, if we were able to harness technology in the right way, if we're able to monitor people more closely at home, if we're able to get them the treatment they need more closely at home, check their labs uh, more closely at home, instead of requiring them to be in the hospital, I think that we'll be able to build a whole new model of treatment uh, that will involve fewer and fewer hospitals and clinics and more people getting care in the place where they want, which is really the place where they live. Thank you. And I would, I would just say, you know, major part of what we do is we try to amplify the voices locally. So what we try to do is harvest those stories in the field um, that's happening locally. But the mobile health departments have to be the ones to kind of bring those voices in locally. Um, and then we can try to elevate those and, and amplify those up. But it has to be a bi-directional engagement. That is, meeting folks where they are, as you just mentioned, but also bringing them into the process doing your, your community health assessment uh, processes and things like that. Let's go back to this one. I'm Bob Harmon, uh, Nature Pass president, and now with Cerner Corporation based in Jacksonville, Florida. And Dr. Murthy, I, I noticed in your background is health information technology. 
I wonder if you can tell us a little more about that and how health IT and electronic health records and interoperability might be playing a role in some of your priorities. And then a suggestion, and that is uh, to involve uh, local and state public health agencies more in health IT. Uh, resources are, are in short supply, and there is a new project called the Public Health Community Platform, which holds a lot of promise, and NACHO is quite involved in that. Well, thank you for that question. As you did note, uh, information technology is, is part of my background. Uh, about seven, eight, nine, some number of years ago, <laughs> I, I was involved in, uh, in taking what I, at that time seemed sort of like a cockamamie idea, which was applying social networking uh, and the principles and technology therein to research. Uh, and I was able to, to work with a wonderful team of people in translating that into a larger framework of tools that could be used to accelerate collaboration and communication in clinical trials, and ultimately to accelerate our process of uh, research and discovery. What that has done for me uh, is it's really, that whole experience uh, opened my eyes up even more to the power that technology holds to improve healthcare. And that's not a simple proposition though, because we know from our personal experiences that sometimes technology can make life harder, and sometimes it can make life easier. And I think when it comes to electronic health records, you know, I'm convinced that the, the future really is that we need electronic health records to be everywhere because the idea that we can't capture data, share data, analyze data in ways that are effective and efficient uh, in 2015 is, is mind-boggling uh, and it's, it's a wrong that we have to right. But with that said, I think that making sure that these systems work well and they're actually, as uh, the gentleman said, interoperable uh, is, is essential. Now, Electronic health records and interoperability are not part of the, uh, the portfolio of, of my office, of the Surgeon General's office, but they are uh, this, one of the central areas of focus for the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, uh, and a, a wonderful leader named Dr. Karen DeSalvo. Her office is, in fact, just down the, the, down the hall from mine, and I've actually had the chance to speak with her a number of times about electronic health records. I know that interoperability is a central area of focus for her and one that uh, she has worked on very hard on laying out plans for. She and many other leaders in the government recognize that we have a lot of work to do uh, in that department, but I would certainly be happy to share feedback that you have with uh, Dr. DeSalvo and with the Office of the National Coordinator. Uh, and I, I just want to say that from, uh, just from my perspective though, I see technology as being integral uh, to our ability uh, to do good public health over the coming years. Uh, and one simple example I'll just share. One of the most frequent questions that I get when I travel around the country, even before usually I, I start a Q&A session, people will come up to me and they'll say, hey, I heard that you were just in Charlotte. And I know that they have a big obesity problem too. What are they doing about obesity that we can learn from? Because we're having a tough time dealing with it uh, you know, in our town. And people will ask me that same question over and over again. It might be about obesity, it might be about tobacco, but they all want to know what are other communities that are like us doing uh, to overcome these challenges. They want to do more than read a story. They want to actually interact with a real person who's helped build the intervention, evaluate the program, and then take it to scale. And they want to know how they did it, what obstacles they faced, and how they might try to replicate it if they were in their city. This is a problem that technology should be able to solve. Uh, and that it, in some cases, in some sectors, uh, other than public health, technology has helped us solve that. When I was working on, on my company, Trial Networks, that was actually one of the problems that we worked on solving, which is to say, you know, researchers who are working on a clinical trial, they encounter all kinds of problems all the time, and a lot of times they're similar problems, but they're siloed, and they often don't know uh, that, that other folks are experiencing the same problem, or they don't have access to them, so they can't join hands and figure out how to solve those problems efficiently. So I think that it behooves us to think about how we collaborate with the tech sector. Uh, and when I meet with folks in the technology sector, health is one of the areas they're actually most excited about, where they want to help do what they can to foster collaboration, improve quality of patient care, to even improve uh, electronic health records as best they can. The more we, as, I think, and especially you as local public health leaders who are seeing problems on the ground, the more you're able to dialogue with uh, technology companies, I think the better. Uh, you know, better off will be. And this is actually one of the dialogues and conversations that we will be looking to start uh, and to really promote through our office are conversations between health leaders and the technology sector. And we would welcome uh, you to all be a part of that. Great. I'm going to go to a question from, uh, from the Twitter sphere. 
uh, here, and this is kind of piggyback from this. Dr. Murphy, I appreciate your presence on social media since taking office. What is social media best able to do to achieve the public? Well, that's a great question, and the question is about what social media can do for health. I think this is a story that's still being written. I think there are a lot of things that I think social media can do for health that can help get information out uh, quickly. Uh, it's a simple example I'll give you. When the Boston Marathon bombings happened, uh, I was actually living in Boston at the time. I had, in fact, gone to see the, the Boston Marathon uh, race itself, uh, and I was only about a mile or so from the finish line uh, as I was watching. And as I walked away uh, from the race, uh, I was with a friend, and we heard this incredibly loud boom. And we knew that there was construction going on in downtown Boston, and we thought that one of the cranes probably dropped its, its load. That's what it sounded like. It sounded like it was a heavy load that was dropped by a crane. And then we started hearing sirens, and we were trying to figure out, well, what happened? And a quick search on you know, the major news sites didn't re reveal anything. But you know, clicking on Twitter immediately told us you know, what was going on. News makes it to social media, as so many of you know, faster than it does, sometimes more often than not, to traditional media sources. When it comes to actually being able to share information about health, I think social media is going to be very important. When it comes to gathering information about what people are concerned about, what are they inquiring about, what are they experiencing, the data that we can mine from conversations on social media will also be very interesting. And some of you may be aware that there's been some very intriguing data already put out there, some papers written uh, on you know, mining that's been done for terms like influenza and other disease terms, uh, which sometimes can be helpful in predicting what people are worried about and even in predicting uh, where there may be emerging uh, disease foci. So those are certainly two areas. But I think that the the additional thing I think that we have to, to realize is that we are in an age where social media is still rapidly evolving. Uh, we sometimes think about social media as Twitter and Facebook, but there are so many more platforms than that. Platforms which often uh, you know, will break down by demographic with uh, people in a certain age range using some platforms much more so than others, with men versus women uh, you know, having different sort of platforms that one versus the other gravitate toward. So I think as we see this evolution, we'll realize that these social media channels can also be, um, can be fairly, uh, you know, especially depending on how they evolve, can be tools that we can use to target specific populations you know, when we want to uh, get specific information out there. So I think that the, the story is still being written on how social media can be used. I'll tell you that the way in which we want to use social media is to, one, uh, make sure that we're using it to get health information out there. Uh, that, that thing is the obvious one. Uh, two, uh, we want to use it as a way, uh, as a bi-directional channel so that we can also gather questions from people and understand what people are concerned about, what they're seeing. Uh, the third thing that we want to do is we want to try to model uh, uses of social, me uh, social media, which will enable people to actually access uh, relevant information that's useful to them. I'll give you a simple example from today. When we were in the airport uh, in D.C., uh, getting ready to fly over here, uh, uh, Lieutenant Aneta, who's, uh, who's my aide who travels with me, and make sure I don't get arrested or get into trouble. Uh, she, she asked me, she said, well, where do you want to eat lunch today? And I thought for a moment, and I said, you know, I would like to eat someplace that's healthy, but I don't know Kansas City very well. Now, we could call up a whole bunch of friends and ask them, you know, hey, where should we eat? Or we could ask the, the Twitterverse, you know, where would be a healthy, healthy place that we could eat in Kansas City? And that's what we did. And we got a whole bunch of suggestions on places to eat. And we actually ended up going to, to one of the restaurants that was suggested to us, and it was fantastic. So when you think about Twitter as a, and, and other social media places, platforms, as a place where you can, as an individual, not as Surgeon General, but as an individual, gather ideas for how you can solve challenges that you're facing around health, whether it's where do I eat, to where can I buy affordable uh, fruits and vegetables, to what can I do uh, if I'm having trouble getting my flu vaccine for my, uh, and my insurance won't cover it, like who can help me with this? When you think about the ability to answer questions like that on social media, it suddenly becomes a much, much more powerful tool. And the key thing is that because social media is often uh, grounded in people's social networks, the answers can come from people that they trust. And then it's upon, uh, you know, it, the responsibility is then up to many of us as public health leaders to make sure that people are armed with the right information so that they can share them more readily. So I think social media is very exciting. I think it's an area that, where we need to push the envelope, where 
I think our conversations with the technology sector are, are certainly going to focus on social media in particular. Uh, but if you, I will say lastly, if you have ideas on how you think uh, our office should be using social media, if you have issues you think we should be pushing over social media, uh, please let us know because uh, you know, we are certainly open to, to new ideas and we want to make sure that we're experimenting and doing as much as possible to advance health uh, through social media. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Benjamin Kutnitsky. I'm a family physician in Warsaw, Kentucky, but also I'm a medical director of the Three Rivers District Health Department. And I'm interested in your opinion about something that our health department is being called upon to, to vote on, and that is the needle exchange program, which is happening in many health departments already instituted in many health departments, but also municipalities using public funds. And because of that, I was interested to know if you might be aware of some evidence-based support for the needle exchange program and what your opinion is of it. Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because as so many of you are aware, needle exchanges have been in the news recently in, the, in light of what's been happening in Indiana. And I know that um, uh, that has reignited a conversation around the pros and cons of needle exchanges. Uh, on a personal note, I just want to say I'm excited to hear from a family practitioner because my dad and sister are both family medicine docs, uh, and they practice together, actually, so we say they have a family family practice uh, down in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> but I think when you look at the evidence from needle exchanges from uh, cities you know, around the country, I think what you see is that there is evidence that it has helped uh, to diminish spread uh, of bloodborne infections. What there is not evidence of is that it promotes IV drug use. And that's very, very important. And I state that because to many of you this is obvious, many of you know this data, but many people don't and there are still rumors floating around from 10, 15, 20 years ago uh, that needle exchanges uh, promote uh, and sanction IV drug use. Uh, and that's just is simply not borne out uh, by the evidence and by the actual experiences uh, of, of cities you know, around the country. This is actually relevant to another issue, which is medication-assisted treatment for opiate abuse, which is that we see similar, uh, I think, rumors and concerns around methadone and around methadone treatment programs, where there are many communities that want to have nothing to do with the methadone treatment program in their neighborhood uh, because they feel that that is, again, condoning and sanctioning drug use. And to many people, the idea of using something that seems like a narcotic to treat something else that's a narcotic just doesn't make sense either. So I think this is an area where it is so important uh, for all of us as public health leaders to make sure that not just the public, but policymakers as well are aware uh, of the science and the data behind needle exchanges between medication-assisted programs for opiate abuse. Because these are the, the kind of interventions which we, which we desperately need in so many communities across America. You know, I'm concerned that what happened uh, in Indiana in one county could easily happen you know, other places in the, in, in the country because the, the setup is similar to what we see in other communities around the country. And I think if we don't work very hard to change prescribing practices, to make sure that we are expanding access to medication-assisted treatment programs, and to ensuring that we're making naloxone uh, more readily available so that we can prevent overdose-related deaths. If we don't do these three things and do, do, don't do them aggressively, my concern is that we will see more situations uh, like what happened in Scott County, Indiana, all over the country. So I thank you for raising that question, and I want you to know that part of our work is going to be to make sure that that information uh, about the effectiveness uh, of needle exchanges and medication-assisted treatment programs uh, you know, gets out to the public and to elected leaders. Hi, my name is Ellen Brudermore. I'm vice president of a behavioral health provider in Taunton, Massachusetts, Community Counseling of Bristol County. We have a NACHO challenge grant to do a mental health first aid, psychological first aid. My concern, and I support medication-assisted treatment, but I must say that um, one of the issues we have is 
the culture within those in recovery themselves not supporting that. Um, running sober housing, many of the individuals we serve don't want to support others to use medication-assisted treatment. And I think uh, educating people within the recovery community, that's an important piece too. I just wanted to mention that um, we're losing a whole population of people. N people with mental illness and people with substance use issues have chronic health conditions that people are dying 15 years earlier than the average public because of the smoking issues and other chronic health issues. So I just think it's, uh, I wanted to hear um, your thoughts on that. People with serious mental illness, uh, they're dying not just from their mental illness or their substance use, but other COPD and other issues like that. So I, I think that's a real important issue to address. Well, th thank you for your question. And you're, you're absolutely right that folks with mental illness, often the chronic illnesses that they're dealing with become secondary in terms of focus, but they're equally uh, as important in terms of the risks they pose to people's lives. We know that the, the prevalence of smoking among people with mental illness uh, is quite high, uh, and it's, it's higher uh, than folks, uh, significantly higher than folks without mental illness. We know that there are many mental health clinics which still allow people to smoke, actually in the clinic, saying that they don't want to have them to, they don't want to create another source of stress for people who are already dealing uh, with mental health challenges. While many, a lot of this may come from a good place, I think the truth is that it's actually not helping patients in terms of health. And the Substance Abuse uh, and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, uh, which is a, you know, a, a group within the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, has actually made uh, this one of their priorities to, to make sure that we can get, uh, do everything we can to make sure clinics, uh, especially those that provide mental health services, are, are smoke-free you know, and are recognizing that they don't have to choose between somebody's physical health and their mental health. But this is something that you can do uh, together that will help, uh, help their health collectively. So I think you raise a, a very good point. I think it, it's also, it's part of, it emphasizes in, in my mind the idea that when it comes to, when it comes to mental health, that we place a lot of barriers uh, around people with mental illness that make it difficult for them to get care. We have still, uh, you know, persistent stigma around mental illness, which it makes it hard for people to come forward and get care. Even if they do come forward and get care sometimes, uh, many folks find it hard to continue getting care, uh, especially when they worry about other people in their life knowing uh, that they're seeking uh, mental health services. Um, we also, it's also challenging given how divorced our mental health and traditional medical systems are, uh, because I remember, you know, when I was practicing medicine in Boston, uh, even though I was working at a well-resourced hospital, there were many times where we admitted patients for a traditional medical illness like a pneumonia or, uh, you know, or some other medical condition, and we would realize that they had significant mental health needs. But to actually set them up with somebody who could see them in a timely fashion, who could truly integrate uh, their traditional medical care and their mental health care, was often quite challenging. And we worried so many times when we sent a patient home that at some point, a week later, when they were trying to figure out what to do with their lives, that they were going to say, you know what, I can only go to one appointment. And the mental health clinic is like 10 miles away and the hospital is like 20 miles away. I can just go to one, I'll just go to one. And that's a real problem when we're forcing people to choose because of how uncoordinated uh, and, and disconnected our system is. One of my hopes is that as we start shifting away from fee-for-service models toward more outcome-based models, more global payment models, that we will start to see financial reasons that will push um, healthcare systems overall uh, to integrate mental and traditional medical care services. Because one thing that anybody who's practiced uh, in a healthcare system knows, and that all of you know so well, is that when we fail to provide for someone's mental illness and care for it or pay attention to it, that makes caring for their traditional medical illnesses harder. Like I knew that when my patients had severe depression or when they were you know, dealing with uncontrolled schizophrenia, the last thing that they were thinking about so many times was whether or not they were injecting themselves with insulin and eating right in terms of their diabetic sugar control. That dropped on their priority list. 
And then they would come in more often to the clinic and ultimately to the hospital with diabetes-related complications. This is not just true for diabetes. It's true for so many conditions. So I think one thing we're going to see is that both to do well by patients, but also uh, to do well in terms of spending our healthcare dollars efficiently, that we now need to move toward much more integrated systems. And I think that the shift in payment systems toward more global payment models will help us make that move. So Dr. Murphy, we'd like to keep you here for an entire hour and feed you and do all that kind of reception coming up, but we want to be sensitive to your time. So I see, I saw two other folks standing up as sole survivors. If you can indulge, maybe two more questions. Of course, yeah. Right, Happy to. Is this is on? Yeah. Hi, I'm John Douglas from uh, Tri County Health Department in Colorado. Just a couple of things. First of all, thank you for your patience, waiting for your confirmation. I don't know if it was the longest in history, but we're delighted that you <laughs> lasted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, secondly, thank you for the dining tips. I wasn't sure I was going to eat tonight, but now I know how to find it. <laughs> um, and then thirdly, I'm. You, you gave a really nice answer to the question about mental health. I'm delighted to see that it's one of your priorities. It's a major focus of public health improvement plans in Colorado. I'm curious whether you have any other thoughts about the roles of public health dealing with mental health. Not a traditional area we focused on, but as you've pointed out, so enormously important. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And, and John, uh, I was just in Colorado actually a couple of weeks ago um, at the Aspen Ideas Festival. And I gotta say, I love your state. It is a beautiful place. <laughs> so uh, you're, you're a lucky man. When it comes to, to mental health, I mean, I think that there, there are three big areas uh, that we need to focus on. One is certainly in ensuring that we are paying for mental health services uh, robustly and in a way that doesn't uh, discourage or make it difficult for people to get care. The second is I think we need to integrate mental health services with traditional medical care in a way that's seamless and coordinated. And the third is I think we need to address uh, this issue uh, of, of stigma, which we still associate too much with mental illness in our communities. I had a, a, someone in my, in my office who told me once, um, he said, you know, if I sprained my ankle over the weekend and had to go to physical therapy twice a week, he's like, I would have no problem telling all of you in the office that I needed to be out to go to a PT appointment twice a week. He's like, but if I had a bout of severe depression and I needed, needed to see a therapist twice a week, he's like, I would not at all feel comfortable telling all of you that that's why I needed to leave uh, twice a week. And that was very striking to me. Uh, this is somebody who works uh, in health who's so deeply enmeshed in the culture that so many of us are, that may, making health a priority and that there should be no difference between uh, you know, how we think about mental illness and, and, and traditional physical illness. Um, but still, the, the cultural impact uh, of years and years and decades and decades of thinking about mental illness uh, as something that, uh, that some folks should be ashamed of, like, that is still strong and that's something that we have to change. And it raises the question of how do you change culture? How do you change, and culture is really collective attitudes and beliefs that people have. So how do you change that and who is best equipped to change that? Well, I would say that the people I think who are best equipped to shift, uh, shape culture are the people who have the trust of a community. And many times that's not a national figure, but it could be a faith leader, it could be a public health officer who knows a community well, um, it could be a law enforcement officer who spent time getting to know a community building relationships with people in a community. Uh, it could be an employer that's invested in the well-being of a community and in creating good jobs there and really uh, cares about doing well by that community. These are the people who I actually think shape culture. And so when we think about what can public health leaders do on the ground uh, to impact mental health, in, in addition to uh, you know, thinking about the financing and the integration of, of services, and the integration, by the way, is so important. That is a place where I think local health leaders can make a big difference. I do also think that when it comes to recruiting uh, local leaders, uh, you know, who are not traditionally healthcare people, but who can shape opinion, in terms of recruiting them to start talking about mental illness, to help make it something that's acceptable uh, to talk about, that's a place where I think you can make a, a really big difference. So my hope is that this is something we can do collectively. Culture change is not easy. Um, I think we know that. But I think we also know from the history that it is possible and we've seen, uh, for example, with seatbelts, that there was a time where people didn't really think about wearing seatbelts, where it seemed like an option, where it almost seemed like a bit of jewelry that cars just happened to have, you know, but it was kind of optional whether you wore it or not. But now, we've been able to shift cultural norms to a place where people actually 
do wear seatbelts, uh, and that's extraordinary. Uh, you know, when it comes to race uh, and racism, uh, while we have a long way to go in terms of creating a society that treats and views everybody equally, we have made progress over time, and that has been not just policy change, but that has been cultural change as well. And again, we have a lot more work to do, but I do think we've made some progress. When it comes to LGBT issues, for example, uh, the recent ruling by the Supreme Court was one I know that was covered so broadly. But I think of the movement for equality uh, in the LGBT community as an extraordinary example of how the attitudes and beliefs of, a, of an entire nation shifted over a relatively short period of time. So there are examples of how we've been able to shift and change culture um, without having to wait decades and decades. And I think that's what we're called to do now with mental health. Great. Thank you. So the last question. Please. Thank you. My name is Terry Mason. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Cook County Department of Public Health. Dr. Hasbrock, congratulations on your new appointment. And Dr. Murthy, thank you for the tremendous patience you've shown in answering with great detail uh, the questions that have been here. And I'm not going to ask for such detail on my question, but I will ask this. Tom Frieden and others have made note that non-communicable diseases are the biggest threat, not just in the United States, but worldwide. And he mentioned hypertension as one of the major risk factors that we need to deal with, as well as obesity. My question for you will be, how will we be able to work with you to limit and work with our food production industry for the reduction of salt, since 74% of the salt that people eat is already in the foods before they get to their plate? How will we work with the, F the um, USDA to create lesser subsidies or modification of subsidies from corn to making fruits and vegetables cheaper and maybe creating a, a better environment that tips the balance to helping us deal with the fact that right now we're looking at people having surgery, children having surgery for obesity as young as five years old. And this is not a sustainable trend. And we have to put forth the appropriate pressures on our other, other government agencies, which are indeed where I think, in, in, if I could use an analogy, I think the food industry today is where the tobacco industry was with regard to public health 50 years ago. So I, I, I just ask you, how do we help you fight that fight? Well, thank you for that, that question and very, I think, astute observation about the fact that food is an essential area for us to address if we really want to tackle the obesity epidemic. And one word about the domestic versus international uh, challenge that we have here. You know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, it was easy, I think, for the United States or for any country to wall itself off and to think, you know, we're just going to think about our health and take care of our people. But in 2015, as Ebola and other conditions have showed to us, you know, domestic health really is global health. And what happens in other countries can often have a profound impact uh, on the health and well-being of the United States. Now, with Ebola, you might think, well, sure, it's obvious there. People can get infected. They can spread the infection. But how does that really work with obesity? You know, no one's like catching obesity from someone else. But when we're in a situation where obesity rates and chronic disease rates are exploding uh, in other countries as they're, uh, as they're developing, when, we're, when we see situations where that explosion is threatening their economies, um, the economies that we are often selling to, you know, as, as exporters, then that actually has an impact on our economy as well. Uh, and so we have to think about the health of all countries, not both because we are, need to be good global citizens and good global partners, but also because we have to recognize that what happens abroad increasingly impacts us in terms of health and in terms of our economy. In terms of the food uh, situation, though, you're right. Salt is a, is a problem. People are getting more salt uh, than they should consume, and they're, they're not getting it from the salt shaker at their own table. 
uh, they're getting some of it from that, but they're getting most of it uh, from prepared foods, from food, and also from foods that they're eating you know, in restaurants. We also know that with sugar, which I mentioned briefly before, which is gonna be an area of focus for, for us, that there is an extraordinary percentage of products that we buy now that have added sugar in them, things which you would never even think about, uh, and products which have far more sugar than you might imagine. Uh, you know, many of us sometimes think, well, you know, eating uh, you know, a flavored yogurt, that, that seems pretty healthy. And then you go and you read the, the nutrition label, and it may surprise you how much added sugar is in some of the flavored uh, yogurts that are out there. Similarly with bread, we don't normally think about bread as something that has a lot of sugar in it, but it will surprise you uh, how high up on the ingredient list sugar is uh, when it, uh, if you look on the back uh, of a bread wrapper. Ketchup has a lot of sugar. There are so many products which you don't think of as traditionally sweet products which have added sugar to them. Uh, and some of this with sugar and salt we can we can start to understand, you know, as in the 80s and 90s when fat became the bad guy and companies started taking fat out of their foods, uh, you know, I think many realize that when you take the fat out of foods, they actually don't taste so good. And so you have to do something to compensate for that. And adding sugar and adding salt are ways to actually increase and improve the taste of foods. So while you eat something that's low fat thinking this is really healthy for me, it could be laden with sugar and with salt. Now, how do we address that? Well, I think there are a couple of things that we have to do. I think one is I think we do need to, uh, to work with industry to see if there are ways that we can cooperatively uh, and voluntarily get them to actually recognize and reduce uh, the exposure uh, that they're creating for the American public in terms of sugar and in terms of salt. But I think that what will help make this more effective is for also generating more public awareness around this as well. When you look back actually at the 80s and 90s, there was a tremendous amount of public awareness that was generated in the, pub, in the public around fat. And, that, and the market responded to that uh, in ways that were very clear uh, and, you know, and very me measurable. And we need something like that to, to, we need to do that again when it comes to sugar and salt. And some people ask the question, well, what's left? If you take away my fat, my sugar, and my salt, you know, like, <laughs> look, what's left? And I think the challenge for, for health people the challenge for me and for you and for doctors and nurses and anybody who's providing advice on health is that it's too often like we're painted as the, as the naysayers who are trying to take people's, the greatest pleasures in their life away from them. We're telling them like nothing that tastes good, don't smoke, don't have sex, don't do anything that's fun in life, you know? <laughs> but, but yeah, no fun. But, but that's actually not how I think we have to phrase it, uh, frame it, which is that I think what we have to, to do is, while we at the, on the one hand say no to some things, we have to be able to say yes to other things. We have to dispel this notion that you have to choose between what's healthy and what tastes good. Uh, but there are things that actually are both healthy and tasty. I was with a chef uh, just uh, uh, yesterday, in fact, in Washington, D.C., a, uh, a fairly well-known chef who has taken it upon himself to see how he can develop uh, food products for his restaurants uh, that are really tasty and that are also really healthy. Uh, and it's a challenge, you know, but it's one that he's actually been able to succeed at. And he's not alone. Others have done that too. And the question is, how do we make those more accessible? Well, I think it's actually very important for our legislators, for our decision makers, to hear about what it is that the public wants to buy more of to hear that, in fact, it is a problem to us that fruits and vegetables are sometimes prohibitively expensive. That they need to hear, I think, that what people from public health experts uh, who know that when we increase fruit and vegetable intake in people's diets, that not only is good in and of itself, but it actually helps to decrease their intake of other products which are actually less healthy for them. And I think, finally, we need to we need our public health leaders to speak to the media about this as well. Because what happens, I think, very often is whether it's through traditional media or social media or, or other channels, these stories become very reductionist. They become simple choices between fat and sugar, choices between healthy and tasty, choices which are easy to write about, but which aren't actually accurate. And what we need to tell as leaders in public health 
is that third story, which is how we can actually have healthy and tasty, how we can have food that is good for you and that is also affordable. We need to highlight the examples of how that's being done. Some of you may be familiar with the Wholesome Wave uh, you know, experience and how that uh, initiative, that company was able to use essentially a double dollar uh, program to give food stamp recipients basically $2 for every $1 uh, when they purchase fruits and vegetables at farmer's markets. That experience has actually been really quite profound and extraordinary. And I know that they are on the verge of, or they're at some time soon, they will be releasing some, of the, some data you know, around their experience uh, you know, with this program, particularly around the health impacts of it. But I think that what we will see is as we look at that, pro at that program and the impact that it's had, that we will find that we have actual evidence now that we can use to push for programs, for policies at a local, state, and national level that actually work, that dispel this notion uh, again, that people who have limited resources don't want healthy food, um, but in fact emphasize the idea that if we can make it affordable for them, if we can actually invest upfront in getting people the kind of diets that they need and deserve, that we can not only do right by them, but we can save a whole lot of money down the line in terms of uh, healthcare costs. That case, the cultural case to the public, the economic and philosophical case to decision makers and policy makers, that is the case that we need to make. And if we can make them, then I think we can also uh, be able to work with industry uh, in, in moving forward and in developing products that are both healthy and tasty. These are conversations that our office uh, will be having as part of our initiative around nutrition. Uh, we can certainly stay in touch with Nature, keep you apprised of some of the initiatives that we're building out around, around sugar, particularly the public education initiatives, as well as the conversations with local leaders and with uh, industry, because we would love for you to be a part of that. Nobody, I think, can speak as powerfully and as effectively about the experiences on the ground and the needs of people in communities as all of you can. So we'd welcome your partnership in that. So Dr. Murthy, on behalf of Nature, on behalf of 1,200 uh, participants and our 2,800 members, I want to thank you for your compelling comments. I want to thank you for your generosity and your time to answer questions and taking time with us. And thank you for all that you do for the nation. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here, everyone. Thank you.